Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's public health webinar, Antibiotic Resistance, How Did We Get Here and Where Are We Going? Today's program is sponsored by the Rutgers School of Public Health and together in partnership with the Region 2 Public Health Training Center. The objectives for today's uh, program is that after a result of a result of participating in the webinar, attendees will be able to convey the history of antibiotics and their current usage patterns, describe how increasing resistance to antibiotics can be linked to prescription patterns, and discuss what antimicrobial stewardship is and how it can preserve antibiotic effectiveness. The public health core competencies being addressed today include 5B2, 5B3, 6B3, and 6B4, and those come from the core competencies for public health professionals. Just as a reminder, today's program, like several of our prior webinars, will be posted to train.org, which is a national clearinghouse of public health programming from around the country. You'll see some of our prior programs listed below here, and there are several other webinars that have been posted to that website. And we certainly encourage you to check that out. Today, we are using Zoom webinar. And as a reminder, there's a chat box command on the bottom of your monitor, and you can use that for asking questions. Feel free to type your questions in at any time, and during the last 10 minutes of the webinar, we'll return to those questions and ask our speaker to respond. And our speaker today is Dr. Edward Lifshitz. Uh, many of you will know him uh, as our medical director for the Infectious Disease and Zoonotic Disease Program at the Communicable Disease Service within the New Jersey Department of Health. In his role as medical director, Dr. Lifshitz monitors reportable diseases and outbreaks in New Jersey, and he helps develop and deliver guidance for the control and prevention of infectious diseases. He helps monitor for and provide guidance for potential episodes of bioterrorism, works to decrease the emergence and spread of resistant organism, organisms and provides education and support to New Jersey's medical community. Dr. Lifshitz graduated from the SUNY Downstate Medical School and is a board certified physician in internal and adolescent medicine. Prior to joining the State Department of Health, Dr. Lifshitz's career included two decades of direct patient care and over a decade in leadership and public health roles right here at Rutgers Health Services. Um, Dr. Lifshitz, thank you so much for joining us, and I will turn this over to you right now. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you everybody out there for joining me on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon, and by beautiful, I guess New Jersey has a low standard. It's actually not raining, which is a good thing, but uh, thank you very much, and we're going to be talking today about antimicrobial stewardship, but first, I just wanted to start out with what a typical office visit often goes like. So you have a patient sitting there, the doctor goes over to him, he's coughing, and the doc goes, hey, lucky we caught this nasty little bug in time for me to treat it. The patient is, well, I guess I should be grateful for that. And the doc is, you're darn right. In a couple of days, it would have gone away by itself. To some extent, that's the issue we have with the overuse of antibiotics in general, is that people are not willing to wait those couple of days for things to go away by themselves. So as we talk about antimicrobial stewardship, let's first define what antimicrobial stewardship actually is. And one of the first things I'll say is you'll hear the terms antimicrobial and antibiotic, and while they're not quite synonymous, they're often used synonymously in this context. I prefer the term antimicrobial, which includes not just antibiotics, which as you know, treat bacterial infections, but antivirals and antifungal and antiparasitic agents as well. Uh, CDC and other people commonly use antibiotic stewardship, You'll hear me use both terms and just realize that, well, not quite the same, we do realize the difference. So how do we define it? Well, there are many different ways to define it. One of the ways is like you see here in the screen where they talk about a set of commitments and actions designed to optimize the treatment of infections while reducing the adverse events associated with antimicrobial use. I think it's instructive to go back to 1962 or just over 50 years ago when we had Sir Frank Mark McFarlane Burnett, who was a Nobel Prize winner, make this statement. He said that one can think of the middle of the 20th century as the end of one of the most important social revolutions in history, the virtual elimination of infectious diseases as a significant factor in social life. He was essentially saying 
hey, you know, we've won the battle. The people have figured out how to defeat the bacteria. We can move on to other more important things. We can worry about heart disease and cancer and those other things. But when it comes to the microbe, we've won. Jump forward about 50 years and you have Dr. Thomas Frieden, then director of the CDC saying, we are potentially headed for a post-antibiotic world in which we will have few or no clinical interventions for some infections. How did we get there? How in 50 years do we go from being so optimistic that we thought we had won the war to saying, hey, wait a second, we may have to give up, we're almost lost. Well, it's important first to understand what we're talking about when we talk about microbes. For example, we know that there are a lot more microbes than people in the world. In fact, there are about 10,000 billion billion more microbes than people. That's a lot of microbes. And we know that um, there are a whole lot of them, five times 10 to the 31st. That's otherwise known as 50,000 billion billion billion. Or for those who want to know how to name big numbers, that's actually known as 50 no million microbes. I'm glad they didn't have me count them, but that's a lot. What most people don't know, however, is that even in us, there are more of them than there are of us. For every one human cell in your body, there are roughly 10 to 5 to 10 microbes. There are 5 to 10 of them for every one of us. I kind of think of it like this. To them, we're kind of like a big cruise ship. We wander around, they hang around, they drink, they eat, they multiply, they excrete, they do all that sort of stuff, but we're their own little universe, their own little ship as far as that goes. And we know that while microbes don't weigh very much, you put them all together and they weigh 100 million times as much as people. So again, they're not very big, but there are a lot of them out there. And we know that they've been on Earth about a thousand times as long as people have. That's very important because one of the things that we'll talk about is how they can mutate and evolve over time. In fact, if you assume that a fast-growing microbe reproduces about every 30 minutes and a human about every 30 years, they have us there by about 50,000 times, meaning they'll have roughly 50,000 generations to one of our generations. Now, PowerPoint is a visual media, and I was trying to look for a way that I could kind of put that into a visual perspective. And this is what I came up with. If you look at this kindly gentleman here, who was born roughly at the same time that antibiotics came into the world to first be used, and you went through his lifetime, or about 80 years. In his 80 years, the microbes in his body have gone through about a million and a half generations, a million and a half generations. That's an awful lot of generations. That's an awful lot of time to evolve. Or to put it another way, a million and a half generations are roughly the same number of generations that it took man to go from this early, progenitor, primitive species through all the survival of the fittest, evolving Darwinian stuff that we went through over that million and a half generations to finally get to today's much more modern and evolved man. So a brief history of antibiotics. Um, forever, people have been trying to figure out how to actually cure infections. Before they knew what infections were, before they knew that there were bacteria out there, they tried to figure out how. Uh, way back in about 1550 BC, this is an actual, uh, this is called the, the Ebers Papyrus, which came from Egypt, which was purported to tell how to cure infections. And they talked about using money, hold, money, uh, excuse me, I'm thinking about money, mold, honey, lard, or lint, uh, all of which, you know, have maybe minor effects, but not a whole lot. Going on, well, we know about bloodletting all through the Middle Ages and past in an attempt to cure infections. And mercury was used, which was, again, mildly affected, effective, but extremely toxic and not very good overall. And it wasn't until 1910 that the very first compound came out there that could cure disease. Salvarsin was an arsenic-based compound that could cure a disease without usually killing the host. That was an amazing breakthrough that had never been seen before. It was so amazing that way back when Hollywood made a major motion picture about this happening called the silver bullet or the magic bullet because it only killed what you wanted to kill. Now that disease that it killed was syphilis, but that was still, again, a huge advancement. This is an actual kit that was used to administer cell arson. As you can tell, it wasn't easy to do. You had to mix it up. There were many side effects. I'm sure 
Insurance reimbursements weren't very good either, so it wasn't used very long. Jump ahead to about 1935 when you had a German chemist named Ger Gerhard Domchek, and what he realized was that cells would pick up dyes. I mean, they knew about things like gram stains. Gram stains showed that bacteria could pick stuff up, so he postulated, hey, wait a second. You know, if rather than just having to pick up a dye, if I could come up with the dye that they picked up that actually killed them, well, that would be a good thing. And that's what he used. He used actual synthetic dyes, the same types of dyes that you use to color clothing. And one of them was a sulfonamide. And what he found was that, yes, it did kill bacteria. And that became the first commercially available antibacterial. Again, a lot of issues associated with it. And you don't hear very much about it. What you do hear a whole lot about is penicillin. Now, this was discovered by Alexander Fleming before uh, Domchek came along, but it took about 14 years for it to be purified and be able to use in any sort of mass way. And, and penicillin was the first true miracle drug. In fact, Ann Miller, the woman that you see here, was the first patient that was treated in the United States with penicillin. This was back in March 14, 1942, and she was a 33-year-old patient who had strep sepsis. She'd run a steady temperature of 103 to 106 for four weeks. She had the best care of the time, including surgery times two to try to limit the infection. There was a very poor prognosis. She was given penicillin. She very rapidly recovered. She defervesced within a matter of a day or two, was out of the hospital, and she ended up living to her until she was 90 years old. Truly a miracle. Now, what else was going on in 1942? Well, World War II was going on. And throughout history, including the World Wars up to that point, more men died from battlefield infections than they did from battlefield wounds themselves. Penicillin was truly the miracle drug of the war, and it was celebrated. It was celebrated in, in such a way that there were signs out there and saying, thanks to penicillin, he will come home. Now, soldiers, not to mention other people, didn't only come home with battlefield infections. They also had other infections that developed, and penicillin was quickly found to work for many of those as well, such as gonorrhea, where you could both cure your gonorrhea and contribute to buy war bonds in essentially the same place. This led to what I call the golden age of antibiotic drug discovery. And what you see here is you see over time uh, large numbers of antibiotics through the 40s and 50s and into the 60s being developed. One of the interesting things here that you see in 1962, now dixic acid, which is the parent compound of the quinolones, was first discovered. 1962. The quinolones are the last new class of agents we've had to treat gram-negative infections. We have had a few others to treat gram-positive infections since then, but it has now been well over 50 years since the last new class of antibiotics that could treat gram-negative infections was developed. And what you see in this slide here is you see the pace of discovery for new antibiotics has dropped off dramatically. Uh, from the 80s down through the early 2000s, you see a dramatic decrease in the rate of discovery. Why? Well, there are a variety of reasons, but the single most important one is it's not terribly economical to develop a new antibiotic. It takes years and hundreds of millions of dollars to come up with a new drug, a new drug that it will likely only be used for a few days and which is a limit to how much you can charge for it. And even if you have this wonder drug that really works and you'd like lots and lots of people to take it for the infections, well, you'd have to deal like with people like me who would be going out and saying, hey, wait a second, don't use this great new wonder drug, use these older drugs because I don't want to build resistance to that new drug. Um, much better to come out with a new next Viagra, something like that that people will keep on taking uh, for long periods of time. So very few new antibiotics are in the pipeline. The federal government realizes that this is an issue, and they have tried to step in with a public-private partnership uh, with some money being put out there to help companies develop agents, particularly those that are focused on antibiotic resistance as well as bioterrorism. And new drug discovery is important, and new antibiotic discovery is important, and we will get new antibiotics, and we will get these new drugs. And here's what I'm going to tell you. We are not going to invent our way out of the problem. Um, there is resistance happens so quickly and development happens much slower uh, 
that while new drugs are important, it is certainly not the only solution we need to take. What you see here, and hopefully you see my laser pointer here, is you see causes of death in the United States going back to 1900 or so. This bottom line here is showing infectious disease cases. What you notice is back in 1900, you were about as likely to die from a non-infectious cause of death, such as cancer or heart disease, as you are from an infectious disease cause. Over the early 1900s, this dropped very quickly. Uh, and this dropped for a variety of reasons, and most of this was related to better public health, things like clean water, clean food, uh, eradication of mosquitoes that bore malaria and yellow fever, uh, that sort of stuff. And then you see penicillin being introduced in the early 1940s and the decrease continued until you hit about 1970 or so when it levels out in the 1980s, it's flat and you get into the late 1980s and early 90s, it actually goes up a little bit. That small rise there is due to HIV AIDS coming in, into play. But what you're seeing is really we do no better today against infectious diseases and probably somewhat worse than we did back in the 1970s or so. And by the way, this big spike here in infectious disease deaths, that's the 1918 pandemic. We're now the 100th year of the great flu pandemic, which is a whole another talk. So what do we know about how antibiotics are used and what do we know about what's the problem with using them that way? Well, here's what I'm gonna tell you. There's a lot that isn't known. Um, there is no single source that will tell you exactly how many antibiotics or what types of antibiotics or for what reasons or any of those sorts of things are being used. But what we do know is that humans in the United States consume somewhere between three and eight million pounds per year of antibiotics. And this is dwarfed by our animals. Our animals consume about 35 million pounds per year. Now, slightly different numbers you see in this chart here, but the same general idea. So why? Why would you use antibiotics in animals? Well, there are basically two broad reasons why you'd use them, therapeutic or non-therapeutic. You use them therapeutically because animals can develop many of the same infections and illnesses that people can. These are expensive animals. And if they were to develop, let's say, a staph skin infection or something like that, it would make sense to go ahead and treat that illness. They're often also used as prophylaxis, meaning if I have a sick animal in my herd, or even I think I may develop a sick animal in my herd, and my herd is very closely compacted in tight quarters, I'm concerned about that infection spreading to other animals. So now not only am I gonna treat the sick animal, or even if there is a sick animal, I'm gonna treat all the other animals in that herd to prevent that infection. And then you got the non-therapeutic reasons. And the non-therapeutic reason really comes down to the fact that antibiotics were discovered to be growth promoters. Exactly why and exactly how still isn't entirely clear but it is clear that if you give mammals antibiotics, they will go bigger and fatter faster. As an aside, there is a theory, and I do not have enough data to know whether there's really any truth to that, but one of the factors for the current obesity epidemic in the United States can be related to the use of antibiotics in children. And whether we use them enough or regularly enough to cause that effect, it's hard to know. Again, Use in agriculture has been seen to be a problem. Um, and we do know that the FDA beginning in 2013 and taking full effect just a couple of years ago in 2016, began voluntary guidelines to phase out the use of antibiotics as growth promoters. Voluntary because it would have been very difficult to get this through as legally binding, but it's in place in any event. What difference has this made? Well, we know that before they went in full effect from 2009 to 2015 or so, that we saw an increase of about 24% in animal usage. And as we, in the last year of that, as we got to when the guidelines were pretty much in place, well, we didn't see any dramatic decrease, that's for sure, but our increase slowed to 1%. So we're having some effect on the agriculture side, but we're nowhere near some of the Scandinavian countries which have put in much tougher controls and markedly decrease the use of antibiotics. So what? What do I care? You know, you get cheap for food, you give the animals antibiotics, they grow faster, you know, let you keep them in closer pens and all that sort of stuff. I'm just gonna eat them anyway, so what? Well, besides for the possible uh, humanistic 
or ethical concerns related to that? Well, I care because when I breed resistant organisms, which is what I'm doing when I'm giving these animals antibiotics regularly, they go ahead and they shed those organisms back into the environment. They can do that different ways. They can do that through the food chain. They can contaminate our romaine lettuce and cause things like E. coli outbreaks that, that may or may not be resistant. And they can do it through their pooping and other stuff on the farm where farmers come by and they're wearing the boots and they pick up resistant organisms and they transfer them more directly back home to their family and our friends. And these things have been seen. And this has been shown that a bunch of resistant organisms, including things such as Salmonella, Campylobacter, Klebsiella, et cetera, you can read the screen, have been assume, shown to be associated with this. Now, as Colleen said, I practiced medicine for 20 years. And never once in that entire 20 years did I ever have a cow come into my office and ask for an antibiotic. People though, they're an entirely different species. They want their z -packs. In fact, Sir William Oslo, way back in 1925, said that the desire to take medicine is perhaps the greatest feature which distinguishes man from animals. And he may well have been right. So what do we know about people? What do we know about human use? Well, we know that about 50%, and personally, I'd probably put the number higher than that, of all antibiotics are unnecessarily or inappropriately prescribed. And we know that it varies depending on you, where you live, your relative risk. And it is a risk because when you get these antibiotics, as we talk about, they can really do harm very widely depending upon where you live. You know, here you got the United States. Up here, we're doing better compared to some particularly Southern European countries when it comes to how many antibiotics we're using. But when you look at much of the rest of the world, we're doing a whole lot worse. In the United States, you have more than twice the risk of getting prescribed an antibiotic than in the Netherlands. And let me tell you, it's not like the people in the Netherlands are healthier than, than the people in the United States. They get sick just like we do. And it's not like they're dropping dead of infections as they're walking down their streets or, or paddling in their canals, I guess. Uh, it's that the United States is really using more antibiotics than need to be used. And even in the United States, it varies quite a bit depending upon where you live. Here in New Jersey, we do pretty close to the national average. Uh, as far as prescriptions go, not horrible. We do do better than some of these southwestern states, but we do a whole lot worse than parts of the country, such as Alaska, where your risk of getting an antibiotic is roughly half of what it is in New Jersey. And again, the people in Alaska aren't dying twice as fast as the people in New Jersey. Again, so what? What's the harm? Well, when it comes to the individual, every time an antibiotic prescription is written and filled, there are costs associated with that. There are costs monetarily. People have to pay a price to get that antibiotic. If it's covered by insurance, well, guess what? Insurance pays, which means I have to pay into the insurance, which means part of my rates are going to pay for somebody else's inappropriate antibiotic use. We have to worry about the side effects. You got the routine side effects, the so things like the nausea and diarrhea, the occasionally severe allergic side effects, um, and, and so forth that can happen. You got things such as Clostridium difficile infection, which I'll talk a, a little bit more about in a second, as well as you got the risk of colonization and or infection with resistant organisms to that antibiotic. In fact, when we talk about Clostridium difficile, commonly known as C. diff, we have seen that the rates have been increasing. In fact, the CDC tells us that hospital stays from C. diff infections have tripled in the last decade and that 94% or almost all infections with C. diff are connected to getting medical care. Because how do you get C. diff? Well, C. diff is caused by this bacteria, the spore, that you then have to get into your system. And it helps if you don't have any of the so-called good bacteria to fight off that bad bacteria, and then it grows. So what happens when you go visit your doctor or you go to the hospital? Well, first off, who else has been in that environment? Well, a lot of sick people. And some of those sick people have had C. diff. And some of those people with C. diff have spread spores around that doctor's office or that room in the hospital. And if people are not meticulously careful, it can be spread to the patient. What else happens in that healthcare setting? You go ahead and you get an antibiotic. So what did I do to you? I put you in an environment where you're exposed to the bacteria. Then I gave you an antibiotic that'll kill off the other bacteria besides for C. diff so C. diff can go ahead and multiply. 
So again, antibiotic exposure is the most important risk factor by far for Clostridium difficile associated disease. And that in the last 20 years or so, there has been a new what epidemic strain of C. diff that's been circulating that has been resistant to fluoroquinolones, meaning if I give somebody something such as Levaquin, again, it'll kill off those good bacteria, won't kill off the C. diff, and it'll allow it to multiply. And I know this about people in the hospital, that if you're hospitalized for any reason, this includes hospitalizations, all comers, everything from heart attacks to cancer treatments to uh, deliveries to pediatrics to infectious diseases, out of all those hospitalizations, somewhat over half or about 55% of inpatients will receive an antibiotic during the stay. We know that about 1% of inpatients develop C. diff and that about 10% of those who develop C. diff die. And it's not just the older, sicker population that you have to worry about, although you certainly have to worry about that in general. But overall, if all I know about somebody is that one patient had C. diff and the other patient didn't, I'm going to tell you that the person who had C. diff has roughly a triple the rate in death compared to the person who did not. So this is not a mild, minor, nothing infection. Here you see rates of C. diff over the years. Um, you see, again, in the early 2000s for a variety of reasons, including the new epidemic strain as well as uh, overuse of antibiotics, rates of C. diff took off. Uh, they have leveled out, which is the relatively good news, even going into 2017 or 18 now. The bad news is we're at much higher rates than we were before. So C. diff is a real problem. And it's not only C. diff, it's resistance. Antibiotic use has been shown in an individual. We're not talking about the population as a whole, but it's been shown that if I give a patient an antibiotic, that resistance to urinary and respiratory bacteria develops those antibiotics that antibiotics may impact on the bacterial resistance for up to a year or so. And that the more antibiotic I give you, the greater the likelihood that resistant bacteria will be isolated from the patient. Uh, these next slides are, are tough to read, but basically this is looking at respiratory tract bacteria and previous antibiotic prescribing. And what they're showing is a whole bunch of different studies uh, and everything to the right of this vertical line here shows a study where antibiotic use was associated in the individual with the development of resistance in the respiratory tract. This is a similar study looking at the urinary tract specifically for E. coli. And again, everything to the right is showing studies showed resistance. And this last one is similar, but instead here we're looking at over time. We're looking at uh, as we move down towards the bottom here, it's longer after the use of the antibiotic. And you see that over time, as we get to about six months after the use of the antibiotics, that resistance is gradually declining, but has not yet gotten back to this baseline over here. So we've seen that in the individual, the use of that antibiotic can cause a problem. Yeah, but what do I care about the individual? I mean, I care about the collective. I care about the population as a whole. I mean, I don't care that much about my neighbor. You don't know him that well. He seems like a nice enough guy, but you know, I'm not that concerned in particular about whether he's getting an antibiotic appropriately and inappropriately. I'm cared about, I care about what's going on around. Well, why do I care from a public health perspective? I care because it's been shown that morbidity and mortality has increased with about 2 million infections and 23,000 deaths per year related to antibiotic resistance. So this is a CDC number related to resistant organisms and what it's causing in the country. I care because it's expensive to go ahead and treat those people. That when I go ahead and I treat it's a resistant infection, it costs me, meaning the general public that's paying for insurance and paying for other things, a whole lot more money than it does to go ahead and treat somebody who does not have a resistant organism. And finally, I can't about, care about it because you know what? I might need an antibiotic one day. My children might need an antibiotic one day and I'd like them to work. And of course, that's one of the hard things about this because nobody is saying you should never use an antibiotic. Antibiotics are truly wonder drugs. We do think that they should be used. They can make a huge difference. We just don't want them overused. So there are a whole lot of organisms that have been shown to be resistant to antibiotics over time. I'm not going to read through them all. You know a lot of these by their names, things like MRSA, CRE, VRE, Visas, Versus, Acinobacters, gonorrheas, 
so forth. Um, the country as a whole is seeing an increase in infection. And we know that in New Jersey, we're seeing an increase as well. We can say, for example, that in 2017, uh, New Jersey saw about 17 possible outbreaks related to multi-drug resistant organisms, excluding TB, HIV, STD. And these included things like carbapenem resistant acinobacters, candida oris, which is a uh, issue in of itself, as well as other resistance. And the other thing that's begun to happen is while travel and receiving health care in a foreign location has historically been a major risk factor, and it still is a risk factor for developing a drug-resistant organisms. We're seeing in New Jersey that the only risk factor has been exposure in New Jersey. And we begin to see things like these. These are actual patient anti- uh, bacterial culture results, and we begin to see things like this with a whole lot of resistance to all normal bacteria that we don't like it to be, maybe one sensitive. Here, this one was resistant to everything except for, again, one bacteria, one antibiotic. When we lose that one antibiotic that we're seeing in many of these things, including colistin, which is an old antibiotic, which was never used for years because it had a lot of side effects and newer antibiotics were better, but now we're using it because those new antibiotics aren't working and soon colistin won't work that becomes a real issue. Um, CRE, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, is a real issue. Again, this is one of the particular gram negatives that we're seeing increasing resistance over time. And if you get a CRE infection, about half the patients who, who get it in their bloodstream will end up dying from it. Briefly, again, uh, we talk about antibiotics and antimicrobial. Not all the resistance that we're seeing is related to the bacteria. The viruses certainly become resistant very quickly as well. HIV, that's why we use a cocktail against them because if we just used one agent, they quickly become resistant. Influenza has become resistant. In the parasitic world, malaria, huge problem with resistance. And in the fungus world, candida, and particularly candida aurus. And if you work in the healthcare setting in particular, if you haven't heard about Candida aurus in the past, you probably will in the future, as it's one of the superbugs that's striking New Jersey now. And speaking of superbugs, hey kid, you want to be a superbug? Stick some of this into your genome and even penicillin won't be able to harm you. It was on a shortcut through the ICU that Albert was first approached by a member of the antibiotic resistance. Now the thing about giving a webinar because I never hear if anybody's laughing or paying attention. That's actually kind of makes me feel like I'm home with my kids because pretty much the same thing, but enough. I laughed, Ed, don't worry. Oh, thank you. Okay, so long as we got one. So let's talk about anti outpatient use of antibiotics. What do we know there? Well, we know, as I said, that about 50%, and again, I would rate that higher, of all prescriptions are either unnecessary or inappropriately used. So why? Why does it happen? I mean, are all the docs out there idiots? Don't they know anything? Don't they come to these lectures and, and read journals? Well, they do, but there are a bunch of reasons why this happens. You know, there's a lack of time. It's much quicker to write a prescription than to explain why you're not giving a prescription. Um, it's much easier when the patient comes in and asks for their z pack to say, okay, because they always get a z pack every time they get their cold, and it always works, because you know what? They do get better to just give them that prescription than it would be to sit there and explain why you're not doing it this time, why they're not sick enough to get that antibiotic, why you don't, why you really know something even though you're all, their old doctor always gave it to them, it always worked and all that sort of thing. So it's much easier to write that prescription, get them out of the office. If you're trying to see six or eight patients an hour, that makes a big difference. There's also diagnostic uncertainty. Um, docs really sometimes don't know, meaning you can have a thousand patients walk into your office with a flu-like illness and probably 999 of them have the flu or a similar illness that will get better by itself, but every now and then one of them won't. And they do get concerned about malpractice. And you know, I give this talk a lot to docs and I gave this talk once and afterwards he came up to me and he said to me, you know, I hear everything you're saying and I know I overuse antibiotics. But I also tell you, I worry about these guys. These guys, or more appropriately, this guy, their creator, Jim Henson, 
went to an emergency department with a fever, looked a whole lot like everybody else looked, and a day later, he was dead of streptococcal pneumonia. And the doc was saying to me, hey, you know, I hear what you're saying, but if he'd walked into my office, I probably wouldn't have originally given him an antibiotic either because he would have looked just like all those other flu patients said to me and he would have been dead and it would have been my fault and I would have been sued. So I'd rather give all those other people antibiotics who don't need it because I'm not taking any chances. I don't want to get sued. And to them, I say, well, you know what? You can be damned if you do and damned if you don't. If you looked at the reasons why people get sued, many doctors get sued for, for malpractice, and you look at it as it relates to medications, you quickly see that antibiotics or the use of anti antibiotic inappropriately in the side effects that we talked about from antibiotics are the number one cause why docs get sued related to medication. And all you have to do is do a very quick internet search, and it's not in the least bit hard to find just a few lawyers out there would be more than happy to go ahead and sue a doctor over the inappropriate use of antibiotics that led to something like C. diff or some other significant infection. So what I tell docs all the time is, you know, you got to do what you think is best for the patient, regardless of what might happen. So what else happens? Well, there's also the whole general feeling that newer equals better, that the drugs that the pharmacy reps are bringing into your office that are on your pens and other things, the broader spectrum ones must be better than the older antibiotics. Well, sometimes you need to use that new broad spectrum antibiotics, but most of the time you don't. Most of the time, you might as well use an old narrow spectrum antibiotic. You know what you're treating. You know it's likely to work. That's the way to go. You have the whole question about perceived and actual patient expectations. Many docs think that the patients are there because they want an antibiotic, and sometimes they are. You know, docs are people, you know, it, they want to do something, you know, they got that sick person sitting in, in their office. And if most people knew how little docs can do most of the time, they might not go to the docs so often, you know, you, you want to do it, you want something, you want to help them. What can you do? Well, the one thing you can do is write that antibiotic prescription, even if it's really not helping them. And lastly, it's the whole what's that harm thought, you know, it's kind of like, uh, talking on your cell phone when you're driving. You know, we all know that we shouldn't do it. We all do it occasionally. You know, to the docs, it's similar. You know, they write these prescriptions all the time. They know that they probably shouldn't, but they haven't seen those bad reactions. They don't see that resistance developing in their patient or in the general population. So they say, ah, what's the big deal? So I'll just give them that prescription and make the patient happier. And docs are different. Um, your risk of getting a Antibiotic prescribed varies widely depending on the doctor that you see. This is a graph showing uh, patients who went to a veterans administration hospital with an acute respiratory infection and what percentage of them got antibiotics for the acute respiratory infection. And basically what it's showing is that the top 10% of clinicians prescribed at roughly twice the rate of the bottom 10% clinicians or so. There are some clinicians there here where the proportion of antibiotic prescriptions you had a essentially 100% chance of getting an antibiotic prescription if you went to this doc here. If you went to this doc here, it was pretty close to 0% chance, all for the same general presenting signs. And of course, it doesn't really help when the general public is seeing things and equating antibiotics with good health care and getting better. I mean, just look at how happy this woman is. You know, she took her, probably her daughter in, she got her free antibiotics, and now everything's all good and they're all happy. Not surprisingly, however, the whole thing about free antibiotics from a public health perspective is not a good thing. And what we certainly don't want to have is this type of doctor's office where the secretary, I should say the receptionist, is saying, don't forget to take a handful of our complimentary antibiotics on your way out. Uh-oh, Colleen didn't laugh at that one. <laughs> yes, she did. Okay. So what do we know about these overprescribing doctors? Who are they likely to be? Well, we know that in general, they tend to be older. This is one situation where the old time family doc is probably worse than the newly minted uh, physician. They tend to be less academically inclined. They tend to be busier, meaning again, if you're trying to see six or eight patients an hour, you don't have time to think about anything. You just give a prescription and get them out. And they often tend to be so-called self-described poor diagnosticians, meaning they'll listen and they'll say, oh, 
Could that be a pneumonia? Might, well, you know what, I'm not sure. I'm just gonna give an antibiotic just to be on the safe side. So that's the outpatient side. On the inpatient side, everything's gotta be better, right? Well, first off, we know again that your risk of receiving an antibiotic for any reason is about 55% as we talked about earlier. So you go into the hospital for any reason, there's a very good chance that you're gonna get an antibiotic. And an awful lot of those antibiotics are gonna be in, in these groups down here as well as up in here, which tend to be a lot of the newer, broader range antibiotics. We know that about four parental antibiotics make up almost half of everything that's given. And we know that it doesn't really matter whether you go to a community uh, versus an academic hospital about whether you're likely to get a prescription. And we know that even in the inpatient setting, somewhere between 20 to 50%, and again, I would tend to think the higher number more accurate, are either unnecessary or inappropriate. Why? How could that be when in, in a hospital you got infectious disease specialists, you got people working there all the time, you would think that this would be a much lower number. Well, there are a variety of reasons why that happened, somewhat different forces on the outside. But first off, you know, the patient might appear to have an infection that's treatable by antibiotics. For example, they might come in with a urinary culture that's positive and you might think that you're actually treating something that's making a difference when in fact the patient is just colonized with those bacteria and you go ahead and you treat it and they'll be back in a week anyway. It doesn't make any sense. We know that sometimes antibiotics are used because you can get into trouble, sued, or sometimes uh, get bad marks on what are known as report cards if you don't use an antibiotic fast enough if you're in a hospital. So again, the thought process is, well, let me go ahead and start as fast as I can. I can always stop it later if it's not a uh, bacterial infection, but often it ends up not being stopped. And we know there is a fair amount of lack of knowledge. We do know that uh, oftentimes you use more than one antibiotic or more than one antibiotic is used when you don't need to. Again, we know that overly broad spectrum antibiotics are commonly used when a narrow spectrum antibiotic will do the trick. Sometimes a totally wrong antibiotic is used. Wrong dose, wrong time. Uh, patients are often kept on antibiotics for too long a period of time, particularly intravenous antibiotics. What I always tell people is you want to get people off of antibiotics, particularly intravenous antibiotics, as fast as you can, because you want to get them out of your hospital as fast as you can, because hospitals are not good places to be. They're particularly not good places to be if you're sick. You know, you're sick in a hospital, you're much more likely to pick up other things while you're there that can cause problems. We want to get them as home as fast as possible. Then we got our other big area where patients get prescribed antibiotics, and that's in the nursing homes. What do we know about them? We know that about 4 million, a little over 4 million Americans are admitted to or reside in a nursing home every year. And we know that up to 70% of them will receive an antibiotic during the year. So about, you have about a seven in 10 chance, if you live in a nursing home, of getting the antibiotic during the year. And we know that in a nursing home, an even higher percentage of people who are misprescribed antibiotics, and up to three quarters of all antibiotics used are used incorrectly. Again, why? There are a whole variety of reasons, including the fact that you know this is a medically frail population, somebody runs a fever, you're worried about bacterial infection, you give them an antibiotic, they usually don't have a whole lot of doctors or other medical staff around who, can, who make a diagnosis. This is often done over the phone. They very commonly are colonized in places like the bladder and other places. So if you look to see if there's a bacteria there, you'll find it. Doesn't mean that it caused the infection. And there are also pressures from family members and others to go ahead and treat their family member. Now, as we talked about, when we talk about antimicrobial stewardship, we're not trying to get to zero. We really like antibiotics. In fact, what we don't want to have happen is this type of scenario where we just totally go ahead and ignore symptoms and didn't give somebody an antibiotic when they really needed one. And to say, to think that we just completely ignored his symptoms and just nicknamed him sneezy. No, you want to treat when you should treat. So what is antimicrobial stewardship? Well, antimicrobial stewardship consists of what are known as core elements, which vary somewhat depending upon where we're talking about, whether we're talking about the outpatient arena, inside the hospital or inside the nursing homes, but the general goals are the same. And the general goals are this. Antimicrobial stewardship aims to increase the appropriate use of antibiotics. And by using antibiotics appropriately, first and primary goal is to increase patient safety. So we want to decrease adverse effects, including things like C. diff, as well as decrease the emergence of resistance over time. 
And if we can save the system money while we're at it or the patient money while we're at it, that's always a good thing. In the hospital, antimicrobial stewardship has been shown to decrease C. diff infections. Uh, this is one study where they went ahead and they restricted the use of fluoroquinolones in the hospital and looked at C. diff infections. Here's where they went ahead and they put in those restrictions and you see, yep, use less broad spectrum antibiotic, decrease the rates of C. diff in your hospital. It's also been shown to decrease resistance. Again, uh, here, what they did was they implemented antibiotic restrictions, made it harder to prescribe certain broad spectrum antibiotics. And what you're seeing here is a percent of susceptible before and after the implementation of these restrictions. So you see that after these restrictions were implemented, that you had more susceptibility, at least in the relatively short term, than you did prior to that. And it's also been shown to save hospitals money. Uh, here we're seeing basically that if I actively manage, meaning I restrict antibiotic use, I go ahead and save costs related to antibiotic use over the year. Um, whoops, sorry, I went the wrong way. And in particular, in New Jersey, it's even been shown at one of our institutions where the roughly annualized cost savings related to using decrease in antibiotics was over $400,000 a year. So we're not talking about chicken feed here. You can save real money in hospitals by reducing the use of expensive antibiotics. And this is just the cost of the antibiotic. This isn't associated with other infections, C. diff or other things that you might be stopping. What can we say about the nursing home and stewardship plans there? Well, we do know that unlike hospitals, there are wide varieties of settings and resources in nursing homes across the state. Um, but in general, while they're not all the same, they should have the same general elements in their stewardship plans that hospitals do. Um, the implementation may vary. We do wanna go about it gradually. You put too many things into place all at one time. It freaks too many people out. It's too hard to do. It's too hard to make the changes. So we do wanna work at it gradually, but it is certainly doable and can be done. What about on the outside? Well, again, we know that there are core elements that go along with stewardship programs. When we talk about outpatient antibiotic stewardship, we talk about we want to have commitment, we want to have action, we want to have tracking and reporting education expertise. And I'm not going to talk in detail about any of these, but it basically talks about the fact you want to put one of these programs in place, you want to get people to stand behind it, you want to make sure that they take actions that are, that are obvious to staff members and the general public, People need to track the antibiotics they use so you know as things change over time, you can see a difference and you gotta teach people things. And it has been shown to work in the outpatients, probably the group of physicians that were targeted earliest were the pediatricians. Um, and they were targeted to try to get them to decrease the use of antibiotics for acute respiratory infections as well as other self-limited bacterial infections such as things like ear infections which would usually go away by themselves. And that was shown that over time, this blue line here has decreased the number of antibiotic prescriptions written by pediatricians. Even while other things like medications for ADHD have actually increased over time. So you can make a difference with these stewardship programs and by teaching people and educating people. Here at the Department of Health, the Communicable Disease Service, or CDS, has a number of staff that are involved in antimicrobial stewardship programs. You have me, who does things like this and talks at grand rounds and talks to prescribers. We have an antimicrobial resistance coordinator and a healthcare associated infection coordinator who does things such as surveillance and response to multidrug resistant organisms, as well as general antimicrobial uh, stewardship program work. We have an infection control assessment and antimicrobial resistance, or ICAR team, uh, they will do on-site infection prevention consultation and stewardship review. And we have health educators who do outreach and education for healthcare and public partners. Recently, uh, Get Smart About Antibiotics has been rebranded as Antibiotics Aware, or here in New Jersey, New Jersey Antibiotic Aware. You see here our website for stewardship. They have edu we have educational resources, staff training toolkits, disease prevention resources, drug resistant organism information. It's a great place to start. Every year is an antibiotic awareness week. Uh, 
nationwide, run by the CDC. We just passed it this week. It was last November 12th to 18th. I like to remember because it, it comes right with Thanksgiving and we celebrate it almost the same way. We overeat. Maybe we light some candles. We celebrate antibiotic awareness week. That's a good thing. And we encourage all of you out there to become involved. Uh, we, enjoy, we encourage you to join our links network. And if you don't know that, in the handout, there is a uh, resource that tells you how to do that and more about what that is. And we encourage you to contact our health educator, Suzanne Miro. Her information is also in that handout as to how you can help, how people can get involved, how we can spread that information out there. We've been involved in a number of projects, including things related to long-term care facilities, ambulatory surgical centers. We have a stewardship recognition program, which is upcoming, where we go ahead and we encourage programs to essentially prove to us that they're providing antimicrobial stewardship. And when they do, we give them a nice award that's suitable for framing and hanging or burning in your fireplace that, that talks about essentially what a great job they're doing. And as we're getting towards the end of our talk here, I do want to end with just a couple of quotes. The first one is from Sir Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, who back in 1945, 1945 said, the microbes are educated to resist penicillin and a host of penicillin fast organisms are spread out. In such cases, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin is morally responsible for the death of the man who finally succumbs to infection with the penicillin resistant organism. I hope this evil can be averted. So just three years after penicillin went into any sort of widespread production, already the potential for resistance was obvious and was being thought of by Sir Alexander Fleming. And it wasn't just our side. It just wasn't the people who was thinking about this because even back in the 1990s, in 1997, at one of their commencements, a bacteria said, you are the next class of drug resistant bacteria. As humans continue to abuse and overuse antibiotics, your ranks will swell. So go out there and mutate. And remember that which does not kill us makes us stronger. So they knew that as well. Thank you. And open to any questions that you might have. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Lifshitz. Um, we do have a question, and I will invite anyone else who has a question to go ahead and type it into the chat box. Um, the first one was from Sussex County. Are hospital microbial infection rates publicly available? I guess, is that data out there at all? So the question is, are hospital antimicrobial infection rates publicly available? And the quick answer is no, only reportable diseases are reportable, outbreaks of reportable diseases are reportable. So if you wanted to know um, those things, you can. In addition to that, there are a smaller subset of infections related to things like central line associated bloodstream infections or uh, urinary tract related to catheter infections, which are tracked and are available. So there is a small subset of that information that's available. But if, if you wanted to know, for example, the rates of um, uh, methicillin sensitive staph aureus in, in a hospital, no, there'd be no way to get that information. Okay, so you're suggesting sort of proxy data, so to speak, that might give you a hint. Yes, uh, and again, there are, in that goes into the so-called hospital report cards, the National Healthcare, Self, National Healthcare Safety Network reporting system, some of these other data that you can look at, some of these other infection rates that can give you a, as you mentioned, a proxy or a broad idea about rates. But if you wanted to get into the specifics or, or to know all infections in a hospital, no, that, that isn't known. Okay, thank you. Um, I did have a question, are there any sort of commonly used antibiotics that now have just been taken off the shelf or do you foresee that happening? I guess I'm thinking of something like amoxicillin that seems to have been used so frequently that even with my own child, I don't see, see it working when perhaps previously it might have. Yes and no is a short answer. Uh, taken off the shelf, no, although prescriptions definitely drop down. A few things. First off, the older, narrower spectrum antibiotics like amoxicillin or penicillin or tetracycline or any of these other things 
that you probably have heard about and grow up with, they still serve many useful purposes. First off, there are some infections which are still very sensitive to those antibiotics, and there certainly are some infections for which amoxicillin and penicillin are still considered to be the drug of choice. Unfortunately, commonly I see newer, broader spectrum antibiotics used when those older, narrower spectrum antibiotics would still work. Uh, they're also nice because they're relatively cheap, meaning that, you know, unlike hundreds of dollars potentially for a newer antibiotic, you know, penicillin is cheap enough that a pharmacy is willing to give it away free because it costs them almost nothing so they can use it as a loss leader to give it to you. And the last thing is I always would tell people, well, you know, if you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself that you really shouldn't give an antibiotic, but you really feel like you have to give an antibiotic, well, at least go ahead and give one of these older, narrower spectrum antibiotics rather than one of the new broad spectrum antibiotics. It's going to cause less problems, be cheaper, and cause less resistance overall. Okay, thank you. Um, there is one more question. Uh, if you feel sick and go to the doctor, should we question them if they prescribe an antibiotic for us without doing some kind of blood or urine or some other type of test? And should we ask if there's another solution that we could try before the antibiotics? I would broaden that out, meaning whenever you go to a physician or any other healthcare provider for any reason and they want to do anything, whether it's go ahead and get an x-ray or not get an x-ray if you're thinking one, or get a CAT scan or do a test or not do a test, you should always ask the question, why? Why are you recommending this particular course of treatment or this particular uh, diagnostic test? Uh, that's always a good idea. Is it ever appropriate to use an antibiotic without doing any test at all? Yes, it is. Uh, there are times and, and probably even the majority of the times in the outpatient setting where you can make a reasonable diagnostic case for a bacterial infection that should be treated with antibiotics without doing a test. There are other times when you should get a test. So the fact that a test isn't done in of itself doesn't mean that an antibiotic isn't warranted. However, I would always say, I'd always ask that question. Uh, I, uh, I see you prescribing an antibiotic. Why are you prescribing this antibiotic? Do you think I really need it? Should I wait longer? Those sorts of things. You should have that discussion with the physician. Okay. Um, I believe that is the end of the questions. So Dr. Lifshitz, thank you so much for um, sharing your expertise. We apologize for some of the technical difficulties that some viewers seem to be um, experiencing. This program it will be recorded and we'll post it to our YouTube channel and I will share that link with everyone as soon as that's done. It's probably will be by tomorrow. Um, and an evaluation will also be sent out to all of you. Again, we apologize for any technical difficulties that some of you may experience. Um, in the interim, thank you all for joining and have a great day. Thank, thank you, Dr. You.